2022 grade 11 format math contest questions 21 through 25. Gustav has 15 steel bars of masses 1, 2, and 3, all the way up to 15 kg. He also has three bags labeled ABC. He places two steel bars in each bag so that the total mass in each bag is equal to M. How many different values of M are possible? We have bag A, bag B, and bag C. So we have to figure out a way of putting two bars in each bag so that the total mass is the same. So for example, let's say I want my total mass to be 16 kg. Well, in bag A, I can put the bar that's 1 kg and 15 kg. 2 kg and 14 kg can go in bag B. And 3 kg and 13 kg can go in bag C. And that is a way of getting all three bags to have the same mass, and in this case, that mass is 16. So that's just one example. They're saying how many different types of, how many different values of M, so how many different scenarios like this can you make? Okay, well, I can do it with 17, right? Because it'll be 2 and 15, 3 and 14, and 4 and 13 like that. I can do this with M equals 18, right? I mean, it's sort of just, the same sort of pattern just keep repeating it over and over until you can't do it anymore and then dot 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 all the way up until m equals 25 which i think that is the largest that'd be 10 and 15 uh 11 and 14 12 and 13 and so on i, I you can't do anything more than 26 because if you did you wouldn't be able to get 26 in something else and i mean i'll, I'll encourage you to try that and you'll see that 26 can't be done. So 15 is the upper limit. Now we have to figure out what is the lower limit. Well, I, start, I started with 16. That worked. How about m equals 15? I think that will work. 1 and 14. Uh, 2 and 13. 3 and 12. I think m equals 14. That will also work. Uh, 1 and 13. 2 and 12. 3 and 11. And then dot, 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 all the way down, I think the lowest one is m equals 7. 1 and 6, 2 and 5, and 3 and 4. And I think that's it, the 7 being the lowest number. So our upper limit was 25. Our lower limit was 7. So any integer between uh, 27 and, sorry, <laughs> any integer between 7 and 25 inclusive and that is a total of, I believe, 19 integers. So 19 is the answer. And these uh, questions, they don't have answer choices, as you can see. So they want you to put that number 19 on your scorecard on the actual exam. A rectangle with dimensions 100 by 150 is tilted so that the one corner is 20 centimeters above a horizontal line as shown to the nearest centimeter the height of the vertex z above the horizontal line is 100 plus x what is the value of x let's draw a diagram and let's put this on the coordinate plane and first let's just draw when it is not uh, tilted so something like I guess this when it's not tilted right so I'll just call this uh, point the origin this is 0 0 zero zero obviously and then uh, let's see uh, this point right here since the dimensions are 100 and 150 this point right here would be 100 comma 150 right the coordinates of that point since it's on the uh, coordinate axes and and I think that's about it I not much else I can do but once you tilt it then it becomes something like this something like that right so it's the same thing it's just tilted a little bit and now they want you to figure out basically the coordinates of this point right here I'll put that in red that point and if you can figure out the coordinates of that point you'll be all set 
Now, I'm going to do this a little bit different. I'm going to plot this on a circle and a unit circle using trigonometry. So first of all, uh, we're going to need uh, to sort of draw a circle. So let's just move this up a bit and let's draw a circle. So first let's draw the coordinate plane. We've got this coordinate plane here and we've got this circle right like that. I'm just going to draw that much. That should be sufficient. Okay, now let's carefully draw some diagonals here. Now the first the diagonal I'm going to draw over here, this diagonal right here. And then the next diagonal I'm going to draw on the other guy, which is from there to there. Okay, and those diagonals I will draw similarly, same thing, but on this diagram over here. So here's the first diagonal, and then here's the second diagonal, like that. Okay, I mean it's not 100% identical to that one but you guys get the point now one thing we need to figure out is these angles this angle right here is going to be very important for us and that angle is also uh, sorry I think I drew a little bit this angle in here that is what I meant that tiny little guy that angle that essentially represents the the tilt Right, because initially the base was right there, and then when it tilted, the base came right here. Okay, so that angle in there, we need to figure out. And we can figure that out pretty easily because they gave us a clue that it's 20 degrees, uh, sorry, 20 centimeters. So if that triangle right there, this is 20, and when it was on the ground, it'll be a right angle, and then this is sort of our theta, right? That's the angle. And we know that the base, when it's on the ground, is 150. We can easily figure out theta, right? Sine of theta would be just, uh, I think I'm going to need, uh, uh, you don't technically even need, uh, uh, let's see here. Oh, sorry, I labeled this cor incorrectly. Uh, it should have been, uh, this is not 150. The hypotenuse is 150. And you can clearly see that from the diagram right here. See, that that is 150 there. Okay, so that's 150. All right, so the sine of theta would be 20 over 150. And then you can use a calculator on, on the Canadian exams. And therefore, it'll be 11.537 approximately. All right, so that means this angle right in here, that angle, is 11.537 degrees. Okay, so what we have to do is we're going to plot that. Now, when this base goes from here to here, it went in a, I guess, clockwise direction of 11.537 degrees. Very similarly, when the diagonal goes from here to here, it's the same angle that it moves by. So that means this is also theta. Got it? Okay, now it is pretty straightforward, and just in case you're not sure how to plot uh, on the uh, circle, I'll give you one example. So let's say this is a triangle, and I want to plot that point. Now on the uh, first uh, coordinate grid, it was 100 and 150, but I want to do it with trigonometry. So how do I do it with trigonometry? that point is essentially going to be r cos theta and r sine theta okay now it's not entirely that simple because we're not in the first quadrant so this one has to be negative right because values on this is going to be a negative value since it's on that side of the graph but the y that's positive so that's okay now you might say okay what's theta well theta in this case, is this guy. This is the theta. So sorry, there's two thetas there, but th this theta is really the one that I'm talking about when I have those guys. Now what's r? Well, r is the radius of the circle. And the radius of the circle, we can figure out pretty quickly. 
using just trigonometry. That point, if you recall, was 100 and 150. So if you're going to put this on a unit circle, which is essentially what this is, unit circle, then that means that this triangle, th the legs are 100 and 150. You use Pythagoras to figure out the radius. And when you do solve for r, you get 50 root 13, right? And because cos squared theta plus sine squared theta is equal to 1, that's very uh, commonly known, all of this has to work out. So let's use this triangle to figure this out, this, this theta right here, that one. Cos of that theta would be adjacent, which is 100, over the hypotenuse, which is the radius of that circle. So r cos theta is 100. Got it? And then similarly, sine of theta would be 150 over r. So r sine of theta is 150. So instead of 100 and 150, we put r cos theta and r sine theta, which is exactly what we did over here. And then, of course, we had to make sure that we put the right sign. All right? So I hope that makes sense. Now, we are going to concentrate on this guy right here, that coordinate. That coordinate is essentially this coordinate moved in that direction by theta. A new theta, I guess. I, maybe I should call it a different symbol, but you guys understand. And that theta, we actually know the actual numerical value. It's right here, 11.37. So therefore, this coordinate right here, let's use a different color. Let's use red. That coordinate right there would be the same thing, r cos theta, but it would be theta plus that 11.357. So theta plus that 11.5. Uh, 37 degrees. You got it? And then instead of r sine theta, it would be r sine theta plus that 11.5. And there you go. That is the coordinates. So now we have to just figure out what that is in terms of a number. And since we want the height, we will concentrate on the y value. So this guy. Okay. So we have r sine theta plus 11.537. Let's be as accurate as possible. R we calculated as 50 root 13. And then the sine of uh, theta and uh, this theta, the, the, this theta right here, this first one. Well, that one's easy. The tan of that theta is opposite over adjacent, right? So opposite would have been 150 and the adjacent is 100. So using your calculator you can figure out that that's 56.3099. So that would be 56.3099 plus 11.537. And when you crunch out these numbers you get 50 root 13 times the sine of 67.8469, and that's 50 root 13, 67.8469. The sine of that is 0.9261, and when you multiply these two guys, you get 166.96, and that represents 100 plus x according to the question, and therefore x is 66.96, and I believe they want you to round up to the nearest integer, so that would be 67. And that is the answer to this question. For how many positive integers k, do the lines with the equations 9x plus 4y is 600 and kx minus 4y is 24 intersect at a point where the coordinates are positive integers? So they just want integer solutions. So I think the first thing we need to do is try to isolate one variable 
and see if that will lead to any kind of help. And let's see, for this guy here, I think I can isolate it to be 600 minus 4y over 9. And then the next one, which is kx minus 4y is equal to 24, that would be, if you isolate 4x in that case, x would be 24 minus 4y over k. All right. So x is equal to this, x is equal to, x is equal to that. Set those two guys equal to each other, and hopefully that will help in some way. 24 minus 4y over k. Okay, so let's see what we get here. I'm going to try to solve for y. So cross multiply, and we get 600k minus 4ky is equal to 216 minus 36y. And let's see here. We're going to isolate for y, so it'll be uh, um, put everything on put everything on one side. I think. I think there's th this should be a a plus here. Sorry about that. That should have been a plus. All right. So we got 36y plus 4ky. Here we have 600k minus 216. And then factor out the y, you get 36 plus 4k. And then finally, y would be 600k minus 216 over 36 plus 4k. All right. Well, that, that, that doesn't really help. It helps a little bit, but it's still not in a nice form. So I'm going to try to make it into a nice form. So that means I'm going to try to make the bottom and the top similar. So a little bit of fancy algebra, not nothing nothing too fancy. The first thing I think I can do is factor out a 4 from everything. So it'll break it down to 150k minus 54 over 9 plus k. And then I'm going to try to get a multiple. Mm, yeah, I'm going to try to get a multiple of 9 plus k on the top. So I think 9 plus k times 150, that would do it. And then I have to subtract this 1404 in order for the numerator to end up to look like that. A little bit of fancy, fancy algebra. It's not that tricky. but And then I think at this point, that just becomes 150, and this becomes 1404 over 9 plus k. And now in this form, it's a little bit more digestible. Okay, so now that we have it in this form, we can now make a list here. So I'll, I'll make a list. I've got 9 plus k. I've got k, y, and x. And remember, we're looking for positive integers, right? Let me, let me go back to that question again. Uh, positive integers, yeah. Both x and y have to be positive integers. All right. I think I can do that. So let's make this list here, and let's see how far we, we, we can get. They want to figure out how many, right? Okay, so it's, gonna, it, it's, it's just basically a pain, time-consuming at this point. But this helps right here because we know that 9 plus k has to divide into 1404 because that's the only way we can get y to be an integer. Yeah, and also, all of these have to be positive. This has got to be positive. This has got to be positive. Yeah. Well, y and x have to be positive. Okay, let's keep going here. So we start basically with values of k, and keeping in mind that 9 plus k has to divide into 1404. And all right, so let's, let's see what happens here. So keeping in mind that we want uh, y and x to be positive, the first time I think y gets positive is when this 9 plus k is 12. And if it's anything uh, uh, less, um, if it's anything uh, less than 12, y will be negative. Yeah, you can, you can double check that. And that happens when k is 3. And when k is 3, you can plug it back into here, and you'll get a y value of 33 for y. And then 
you can plug that into uh, where is it this equation right either this one or this one actually this one is probably simpler that x is equal to 600 minus 4y over 9 and you will get a value for x and that will be 68 so here is a good example of, of uh, uh, integer coordinates and they want you to figure out how many such so keep going here um, how about if you have 9 plus k equal to 13 then that means k is 4 this will be 42 this will be 48 and that's all it is you're just gonna plug values um, and then concentrating on the fact that 9 plus k has to divide into 4 1404 and that's why you can kind of jump here the next one you can jump to 18 you don't have to go 14 15 because you can you only have to worry about numbers that go into 1404 evenly that would make this 9 this would be 72 but this becomes 34.6 so that's no good this is good but that one because X has to be an integer and then similarly you keep on going this will be 17 96 24 and then I'll just write down the ones that work if you keep going 39 this will be 30 this will be 114 this will be 16 52 43 123 12 uh, and then some of these don't work but, but I'm gonna skip over those you can figure that out with your calculator 132 8 and then so this one worked these these guys and then there's one more when this is 156 this is 147 this is 141 and this is 4 so you have 1 2 3 4 five six seven of these values so seven and they want you to write it in terms of a two digit so it'll be zero seven there are functions f at x for which the following properties hold true f at x is ax squared plus bx plus c and f at p is f equal to f at q is equal to 17 and f at p plus q is 47 for some prime numbers for each such function, the value of f at p dot times q is calculated. The sum of all possible values of f at p times q is s. What are the rightmost two digits of s? So f at x, they're saying, is equal to ax squared plus bx plus c. Okay, great. And they've given us a few more clues that f at p is equal to f at q, and that is equal to 17. And f at p plus q is equal to 47. Okay. All right. Anything else that they gave us? I don't think so. Okay, so let's work with this. The fact that f at p is equal to 17. So f at p would be f at p. If you sub p into there, it would be a p squared plus b p plus c. And that's equal to 17. And in a very similar way, f at q would be a, uh, let's see here, let's get the right letters, a q squared plus b q plus c, and that's also equal to 17. All right, so where do we go from here? Huh. I guess we can just use these two equations. Let's subtract them. And when I do, I would get a p squared minus q squared plus b p minus q. The c's would cancel, and that would become 0. Okay. And then I think this would factor p minus q, p plus q, plus b p minus q is 0. Now, p and q are different, right? Yeah, because p is less than q. So the, since they're different, we can divide through by p minus q divide by p minus q because they're not the same if they're the same they would be zero and we, we wouldn't be able to do that so if we divide through by p minus q we could get left with a p plus q plus b is equal to zero and i think that's a pretty decent uh start to this question although at, at this point it doesn't seem very clear but now we can use this one i think this should have been an f yeah, I think that's what I meant to write. F at P plus Q, 
is 47. So subbing that back into our main equation, that means uh, a p plus q squared plus b p plus q plus c is 47. Okay. And then I think we can factor out a p plus q, and then that will give me a p plus q plus b plus c is 47. Aha. So this is 0, so that means this guy is 0. So put that 0 in there, and that just leaves me with c equals 47. Okay, so that's a pretty good finding. Now, where do I go from here? I think I can use this, these guys up here. This one, f at p and f at q, those guys. Okay, so let's try to stay on the same page as much as possible. Okay, so now that I have my c value, I'll sub it into the first one. So that means that a p squared plus b p plus 47 is 17. And therefore, a p squared plus b p is minus 30. Factor out the p, and I have a p plus b is minus 30. Okay, and then in a very similar way, I'll plug it into there. A, a q squared plus b q plus c, which is 47, is equal to 17. And therefore, a q squared plus b q is equal to minus 30. And therefore, a, uh, what am I factoring out of here? A q this time, right? I got to factor out a q. So q, a q plus b is minus 30. All right, good. Now, P and Q are prime, right? P and Q are prime numbers. And P is less than Q. All right. So that means the only way that this equation and this equation can possibly be true is if P and Q are both divisible, are, are both divide into 30, meaning they are both divisors of 30 or negative 30 30 th negative 30 same thing All right that's the only way that this equation and this equation can hold true so let's see what are our candidates there 30 is what is it 2 times 3 times 5 so p can be either 2 3 or 5 and q can be either 2 3 or 5 but then p is less than q so we don't have that many uh, possible um, uh, combinations we have to abide by this rule so if P for example was 2 then Q could be either 3 or Q could be 5 that would meet the criteria how about if P is 3 then Q can only be 5 and if P was 5 then that would not work because Q ha there's no possible choice for Q so we have three scenarios Okay, so we have three scenarios. Let's work with that. Scenario number one, scenario number two, scenario number three. All right. So the first one, this one right here, P is equal to two, Q is equal to three. Okay, so let's see what we got. Let's remind ourselves of our equations. This one here and this one here. Those are the ones that we're going to use. So let's use them let's bring them down here so the first one was um, p times a p plus b is negative 30 and the other co equation was q times a q plus b is negative 30 so let's substitute p is equal to 2 and q is equal to 3 when I do I get, um, uh, what do I get? P, P is equal to 2, Q is equal to 3. So I get 2A plus 3 is equal to negative 15 if, for this one. And for this one, I get uh, 3A 
plus b is equal to minus 10. Okay, so now let's solve this, and you guys can solve this. Uh, you don't need to hear me. Hold on, I, I think I made a mistake here. This should be a b, sorry. Let's just clean that up here. That should have been a b, not a 3. Okay, so 2a plus b minus 15, 3a plus b is equal to negative 10. You guys know how to solve that. So solving, you get a equals 5 and b equals to negative 25. And therefore, my f at x, which if you recall was ax squared plus bx plus c, would be uh, 5x squared minus 25x plus 47, since c was 47. And therefore, f at pq would be f at uh, 2 times 3, which is f at 6. And if you put f at 6 into this guy, and crunch out those numbers, it would be 5 times 6 squared minus 25 times 6 plus 47, and that is 77. Okay, so that's one value of f at pq, 77. In a very similar way, we will now proceed to this guy, where p is 2 and q is 5. p is 2, q is 5. So this time, these equations right here, they become... 2a plus b is equal to minus 15, and 5a plus b is equal to minus 6. Okay, so same thing, solving these guys, you will get that a is equal to 3, and b is equal to negative 21. And therefore, my f at x would be 3x squared minus 21x plus 47, and f at pq, this time p is 2, q is 5, so f at pq would be f at 10. And that's 3 times 10 squared minus 21 times 10 plus 47. And that is 137. So there you go. That's another value for f at pq. And the last one would be this one. When p is equal to uh, 3 and q is equal to 5, p is 3, q is 5. So using those equations, p, when p is 3 and q is 5, we would get 3a plus b is minus 10, and you would get 5a plus b is minus 6. Solving, you would get a equals to 2 and b is equal to minus 16, and therefore f at x would be equal to 2x squared minus 16x plus 47. f at pq, well, this time it's uh, 3 times 5, so f at 15. That would be 2 times 15 squared minus 16 times 15 plus 47, and that is going to be 257. So there you go. We now have all possible values of f at pq. This one, which is 77, this one, which is 137, and this one, which was 257. So all the possible values, if you add them up, are 77 plus 137 plus 257, and that is 471. And they want the right two most digits, which are these guys, so that would be 71, the answer to this question. In the 3x3 three three grid shown, the central square contains the integer 5. The remaining 8 squares contain the letters A through H, which are each to be replaced with an integer from 1 to 9 inclusive. Integers can be repeated. There are n ways to complete the grid so that the sums of the integers along each row, column, and diagonal are all divisible by 5. What are the rightmost two digits of n? All right, so we will look at this in parts so the first part is to kind of just look at the diagonals or the corners I should say a C F and H like that now they're saying that the diagonals the rows and the columns are all divisible by 5 so for example if this a was equal to 1 then that H must be either a 4 or a 9 that's the only way that the sum would be divisible by 5, right? Because uh, 
essentially a plus 5 plus h has to be some multiple of 5. That's the only way. Now the 5 is already a multiple of 5, so really what we're looking at is a plus h is a multiple of 5. Okay, pretty straightforward. So same thing with a equals 2, h is going to be 3 and 8. When a is 3, h can be either 2 or 7, and so on. So those are the possible values of um, a and h. So what we're going to do is we're going to use a different notation. Instead of using f and h, we're going to use uh, the sort of the complement of a. And same kind of story holds true for c and f, right? It would be the complement of c. Where a and the complement of a, if you add them up, are divisible by 5, as illustrated over here. All right, so that's sort of the beginning. Now we're going to look at the horizontals. The, with this one was sort of looking at the diagonals. Now we're going to look at the horizontals in a very similar way. So again, we've got our little diagram here, and we'll fill it out. It's A, C, the fives in the middle, the complement of C, complement of A. Now let's concentrate on that horizontal. And remember, that letter was B, right? This guy was B in here. I'll just write B in here. So A plus B plus C has got to be some multiple of 5, right? So that means if I just add A plus C, and then I add B, that's got to be a multiple of 5. So this and this are complements with regard to divisibility. So instead of writing B, I can just write the complement of A plus C, like this. All right? So that's, in a very similar way, I'm going to make a table that we have a plus c and b. So for example, if a plus c was 2, uh, or 7, or 12, or 17, b can be either 3 or 8. Correct? Because that's the only way it could be divisible by 5. Similarly, if you have 3, 8, 13, and 18 for a plus c, B, B can be either 2 and 7. If you have 4, 9, and 14, B can be either 1 and 6. And if you have 5, 10, and 15, B can be 5. And 6, 11, and 16, B can be either 4 or 9. So, that means we've got a few scenarios here. The first scenario is that A is going to be equal to C is going to be equal to 5. That is sort of like that scenario. Something like that. Something in that kind of category. The other category is if A is 5, but C is not equal to 5. Another category is if the complement of C is equal to 5, but A is not 5. And then another category is where a is not 5 and c is not 5. So each of these is going to give us scenarios, and then we have to add up the number of scenarios. So here we go. All right, so let's start with the first one. The first one is basically where we have a is equal to 5 and c is equal to 5. So, if that's the case, we'll draw a little box, and if you recall, this was always 5. Now we're saying this is 5, and then we're saying this is 5, right? Well, if that's the case, then the only number that can go in here is a 5, because the numbers are between 1 and 9, right? And the, the horizontal has to be, the sum of the horizontal has to be divisible by 5. Very similarly, the only number that can go in here is 5. And in a very similar way, the only number here that can go is 5. So that means that if we keep uh, figuring them out, the, the, the empty boxes, those empty boxes, there's only 3, are also going to be 5 each. So essentially, you have an entire square with all 5s. And there's only one way of making a square like that. 
So this first one really just gives us one possible way. So that's sort of the straightforward one. Okay. So now we'll move our attention to a little bit something a little bit more complicated, and that is option number two. And option number two is this guy right here. And that is where a is equal to five, but c does not equal five. Okay. So let's make our table again. So five is in the middle, we know that. A is five. And then we now know that C cannot equal 5, so this guy in here cannot equal 5. Okay, so I'm just going to put C. And then this is going to be the complement because the sum has to be divisible by 5. And anything else? Well, th this is 5 right here, and this middle is 5, so this must, must be 5 by uh, uh, because it's the only choice. And this corner will put the complement of C. So let's see here. Let's see. What I essentially did was I had put A as 5, and if you recall, H is 5, if you first remember. Okay, so what are my possible choices for C? I can have either 1, 2, 3, 4. I can't put a 5 because C is not equal to 5. Or I can put 6, 7, 8, or 9. Correct? So that gives me 8 possible choices for C. What about for the complement of C? When it's 1, C can be 4 or 9. When c is 2, the complement can be uh, 3 or 8, and so on, right, etc. So that means that for each c, the complement of c has two for each, two choices. So that means our empty cells Those will have uh, similar choices as we did up here, way up here, if you remember. For every value of A, we had two choices. So for example, if A was 4, we had two possible choices for H. So it's the same thing. For every possible value of C prime, we have two possible values for the empty cell. So for example, if C prime was 4, the, H, uh, sorry, this, the empty cell could be 1 and 6. So again, two each. So let's count this. Some of these are fixed, so there's not much you can do. But for the C, we've got eight choices. For the C prime, we've got two choices. But there's two C primes, so it's two and two. And then we have empty cells, we'll just call those E. There's three of those. And for each of these, th they've got two. So if you, add, if you multiply all of these guys, it becomes two to the power of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, two to the power of eight which is 256. Okay, so that is sort of the hang of this. Okay, so now let's keep going here. What's our next one? This one, right? C, complement, and A. Okay, so we got... Sorry, I, I think that should have been just... Uh, that should have been just a C. I'm not sure why I put that complement there. Sorry about that. Okay, so the next one is just uh, basically C is equal to 5 and A does not equal 5. And the good news here is that the argument here is the exact same as this. So instead of going through the whole thing again, I'll just write it out that it's 256. So that's an easy one because it's the same in terms of its breakdown. Now we move on to something a little bit more challenging. That's this one right here. And that one's challenging because that it in itself has three possible uh, scenarios. So we've got A is not equal to 5 and C is not equal to 5. And that is going to be three different scenarios here. We're going to have one scenario, two scenario, and three scenarios. The first one is if you have A not equal to 5, C not equal to 5, but when you add them, they are a multiple of 5. Okay? The next one 
is again a does not equal 5 and c does not equal 5 but when you add them they also are not a multiple of 5 and also if you subtract them they are a multiple of 5 and then the last scenario is again a is equal to 5 c is equal to 5 or not equal to 5 I should say when you add them they are not a multiple of 5 and when you subtract them they are also not a multiple of 5 okay so let's do this go through this so if we have a equal to 5 that means uh, sorry a not equal to 5 then a can be either 1 2 3 4 but it can't be 5 but it can be 6 7 8 or 9 so that means we get a possible choices for a similarly c well for example if a is equal to 1 C can be 4 or 9, right? Like that. If A is equal to 2, then C is equal to 3 or 8, and so on. So that means for each C, we got two choices. Now, what about A prime? A prime is very similar that you've got two choices for each. So, for example, if A was 1, uh, a prime would be either 4 or 9 and so on and very similar for C prime we have two choices for each so for example if C was 4 uh, C prime could be 1 or 6 right so when you make this table like this you've got the 5 in the middle we got A here, we got C here, we have A plus C uh, prime or complement, whatever you want to use. C complement, A complement. And therefore, let's see what we have. For the A, we got eight possible choices. For the C, we have two. For the A complement, we've got two. For the C complement, we have two. And then the empty cells, we have three of those. Each of those, as previously described, will have two. So this looks like when you multiply all these guys, it will be one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Or sorry, how many empty cells do we have? We have three empty cells, right? Ah, I see. A plus C is a, a multiple of five. Ah, so that actually means that one of these empty cells is not going to be an empty cell since a plus c is a multiple of five then we know that we don't have to worry about that that's just going to be something divisible by five yeah so it's going to be five or ten or fifteen so whatever a plus c is we just have one choice for that and since uh, A plus C complement is actually represented by B, and B can be only a, a, a number from uh, 1 through 9, the only possible value for B is 5. So there's only one possible value. So this is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So this is, again, 2 to the power of 8, which is, again, 256. Okay, so 256 there. Okay, let's move along here. The next one. In a very similar way, but this time a is not equal to 5, c is not equal to 5. The sum is not a, is not a multiple of 5, but the product is. Sorry, the, the, when you subtract them, it is a divisible by 5. So let's see here. The 5 goes in the middle, and then we've got a, a plus c complement c, and then we have a complement c complement. And let's see what this does here. Okay. So now, for in, in a very similar way as, as we did up there, A has eight possible choices. The C has two. The A complement has two. The C complement has two. And then the A plus C complement. Uh, and then we have the three empty cells, right? We're actually... And then now it's not as straightforward, uh, so I have to explain it. 
Remember, a plus c, we're saying, is not divisible by 5, right, according to that guy. So let's give some numbers here. Let's say we have a was 1 and c is 6. a plus c is 7, which is not divisible by 5. So that means a plus c, the complement, there's two choices this time. Uh, if we had 1 and 6 for a and c, then a, in order for this horizontal to be divisible by 5, the sum would have to be divisible by 5. And that would mean that a plus c complement, or b, this letter was b, would have to be either 3 or 8. So you can see uh, that would make it divisible by 5, the horizontal. So that means a plus c complement has two choices this time. Now we look to the empty cells. We've got this empty cell, I guess this uh, one on the right, uh, the one on the left, and the one on the bottom. Now the one on the right, it's going to be A plus C complement, right? Plus that empty cell. That's got to be divisible by 5. Now A, we have five, a 1. C complement, well, if C is 6, then the complement would be either 4 or 9. Now think about it. The only choice, therefore, for that E is 5. That's the only way. So 5 by default. So there's only 1. Similarly, this is going to be 5 by default, only 1. Now the bottom is a little tricky, though. Because the bottom, you've got C complement from an A complement. If A was 1, then A complement is either 4 or 9. And C complement, well, C was 6, so C complement would be what? Uh, either uh, 4 or 9 also. So A complement plus C complement, that would be uh, either uh, 8 or 13 so that means that has two choices it could be either a complement plus c complement and therefore if you want that to be divisible by 5 that bottom empty cell is going to be either uh, 2 or 7 so you got two choices there you got it so this is what 1 2 3 4 5 6 7 8 again 2 to the power of 8 which is another 256 all right Moving right along, and then the last one. This time we've got a little bit different criteria. We've got A not equal to 5, C not equal to 5, and then the sum and the subtraction, the difference, are also not multiples of 5. So we got, again, A, C, the complement of A plus C. The 5 goes in the middle, complement of C, complement of A. All right, so this time, same thing, A, C, A complement, C complement, A plus C complement, and then we've got the three empty cells, E, E, and E. Let's see. For A, we have eight choices, as before. For C this time, however, we're uh, a, lim a little bit limited here because, for example, if we have, if you had, say, uh, A is equal to 1, then C can only be 2, 3, 7, and 8. It, it, can't, it can't be 5, and the sum cannot be divisible by 5, and the difference cannot be divisible by 5. So we actually have 4 here. A complement is very similar to before. That's just going to be 2. C complement is 2. A plus C complement is very similar to the explanation up here, which is 2. But this time, the, the empty cells are similar to the explanation for this guy that each of them will have two possibilities because of all, all of our restrictions. So this will be two, this will be two, and this will be two. So this is one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. So this is actually two to the power of eleven this time, which is two, zero, four, eight. All right, so now our final task is to add all these up. Let's see, we had this was one, two fifty six, two fifty six. 256, 256, and 2048. So we've got uh, 1 plus 256, and I believe there's four of those guys. And then we've got this 2048. And when you add that all up, it's 3073. And they wanted the last two rightmost digits, and that's 73.